Well, hi everyone and greetings from Northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy and we've got a special treat for you today. Now, many of you may know I'm a pilot. Blue Marble Science is also a pilot. And we're gonna devote this episode to Blue and I talking about various topics in aviation that relate to the flat earth and some of the flat earth arguments. So let's cue up the music and get going. Well, the next one is one that is kind of close to you and I, and that is that airplanes would have to dip their nose to go around the curve of the Earth. This is actually what got me into looking at Flat Earth. You know, I figured <laughs> I'd make a, a little 10-minute video on my dining room table. I'm a pilot. I'm showing them exactly why you don't have to do that. And I figured that was it. Then the fight began, and I come up on my 400th video here very shortly. I understand absolutely you feel my pain eh yes i do that's one that uh, particularly irritates me harry how do airplanes fly and this is something uh, that they have a hard time with i think just um most of it has to do with the fact that they they're, they're not pilots they've not uh, they've not had any of the experiences and they don't really understand how an airplane works uh, an airplane has um, uh, only uh, only a handful of, of, of meaningful forces acting on it. It has lift that the wing is producing, and that's counteracting the weight of the plane. It's got drag, which is a price you pay for the lift, part, for the most part, plus uh, some parasitic drag, and thrust that's counteracting that drag. So you really only have those four forces involved. And as long as lift and, and uh, weight are equal, and thrust and drag are equal, the airplane will fly in straight, what we call straight and level flight. What is straight and level flight? Straight and level flight simply means you're not climbing or descending and you're not accelerating or decelerating or turning. Well, yeah, you're not going left or right. You're holding your altitude above sea level the same. Since the earth is curved and sea level curves with the surface of the earth, we will be in straight and level flight, even flying a curve over the surface of the earth. They're in parallel to each other. It's not straight like a laser. You, you can't not be in straight and level flight if you maintain your altitude. Yes, and, not, and don't turn. You're in straight and level flight by definition. Right. As long as you're not turning and as long as your altitude is not varying, you are in straight and level flight. And the airplane will do that all by itself. Yeah. If you get the airplane trimmed for whatever altitude you, you want to be uh, at, let's say uh, uh, 10,000 feet, when I say trim, we've got a trim wheel, as you know, in the plane, and that adjusts a tab on the, on the elevator. And that is used to uh, for us to be able to re relieve all the pressure any pressure that we would have to exert on the control yoke. And when you get that thing balanced, the airplane will just simply maintain that altitude. Unless something from the outside, like a crosswind, blows you one way or the other, right? Yeah, if something, if something upsets it, um, it, as you burn fuel off and get lighter, it may want to climb slightly. You know, you, you can have some minor things like that happen. But pretty much it will fly hands off. Yep. And it will just stay at the same altitude. Why? Because the airplane doesn't know what altitude it's at. It doesn't care what altitude it's at. It only knows the density of the air mass that it was trimmed to fly in. And if you if it descends, it descends into denser air and it increases lift when it does that, so it will climb back up. If it climbs, it will climb up into less dense air, it lose lift, and it will descend all by itself. That's how it works. You know, when you look at the old World War II movies, they're always wearing their dress cap with their headphones over it, and they always have both hands on the yoke of the aircraft. Mm -hmm. Have you ever flown with both hands on the yoke of the aircraft? I don't know about you, but I generally use a thumb and a finger just to kind of keep the yeah. thing from... That's all. That, that's it. That's yeah. all you need. Yeah, it's just I basically would... to keep the yoke from getting bumped. Yeah, yeah. You know, and that's without an autopilot. That's hand flying the aircraft. So, now certain, you know, certain airplanes, uh, certain types of airplanes may need a little more brute force when you're trying to land them. 
uh, you may need to exert some additional control pressure, back pressure to flare the thing. Like the Cessna 182s are really bad about that. Yeah, they but, fly like a rocket. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Kind of like flying a pickup truck. Yeah. But, but uh, up in the air, no, you don't need more than just, you know, a couple of fingers. Plus that big old engine sitting out in the front kind of makes you want to flop down and you got to keep the nose of the airplane up. Now, the other thing is when you're trimmed to fly at a certain speed and a certain altitude, okay? Yeah. If you turn off the engine, what happens to your speed? Nothing. Okay. What happens to your altitude? You go down. Yeah. You start sinking. Does the, does the angle of the aircraft, you know, the, the pitch angle of the aircraft change at all? Nope. It just goes the same speed, but instead of going along under engine power, it just drop. it starts sinking. Yeah. And eventually fine. you're going to sink to the point that we're going to euphemistically call that we're going to land. So <laughs> yeah. if, so long as the engine or the propeller does not fall off, which is bad for reasons that a lot of people don't understand, and that is if you lose the engine and, and or the propeller in the front of the airplane, your weights and balances are shot to hell, and you end up going down tail first. But if the engine just cuts, you can continue to fly. You're just going to start descending. You're just going to be landing. You That's know, right. And, and, and down here in the lower 48, I learned to fly in Alaska. And we didn't have this benefit there, but down here in the lower 48, there's always an interstate lo- lurking around somewhere. You can land on the highway, not a problem. Highway, bean field, something. Yeah. Plus, you happen to be up over the top of the Smoky Mountains in my neck of the woods. Yeah. Um, I've had two times I almost got gathered flying an airplane, and neither of them were in Alaska. One was in Sault Ste. Marie. And the other one's down in your neck of the wood at freaking Ash County Airport in North Carolina. I, I forgot it. about rotor clouds. <laughs> yeah, that can happen. Yeah, well, I kind of remembered it uh, as I was landing and looking up at the runway, which was out on a little ridge. I was in the yep. valley looking up on the runway. I hit full power and climbed to my landing. That was kind of an interesting experience. <laughs> That's not the way it's supposed to work, but I'm still uh, here. Been, yeah, yeah. We, I think we've all had those experiences. Yeah. Well. But the thing, you know, the thing pilots say, uh, we we learn uh, is, um, you know, back to what we were talking about, pitch is, pitch is airspeed, power is altitude. Yes. And that's one of the uh, axioms that you get across to a student very quickly. Yes. When you start teaching somebody to fly. Uh, that's a, that's a wonderful demonstration. You take a student up and I used to do this, uh, with every one of the, of the guys I ever taught guys and girls. I, I taught, uh, take them up, get the plane trimmed and then just ask them what's going to happen if I pull the, pull the engine power back to idle and they'll invariably say it's going to slow down. No, it won't. In fact, it may speed up a little bit Yeah, because you take some of the, you take some of the airflow off the top surface of the uh, horizontal stabilizer, but uh, it always surprised them when you when you can pull the power back and the airspeed doesn't change, but the plane starts going down. You know what? A lot of people don't understand is how airplanes actually land. A lot of people think that you fly it down to the ground. You don't. What you do is you put your nose up, and then yeah. you trim for your airspeed that you want. Say. 80 miles an hour, 85 miles an hour. And then what you do is by controlling the power, you either descend or level off or whatever you need to do. And you, and you work down the glide slope to the runway and you end up landing like that. Yeah. If you do a perfect, absolutely perfect landing approach and landing, it is a continual upward movement of the nose of the plane all the way to touchdown. Mm Mm-hmm. And by upward movement, that means that you're slowing down as you get close to the threshold. So like, for example, in my, in my aircraft, I have to fly, you know, my safety speed just be bopping around is 120 miles an hour. My VMC is 85 and that's not really important what that is. Harry, you'll know what that is, of course. But as I come around, I fly around at 120. Now, once I'm lined up on final, 
I want to be at about 105 miles an hour as I cross the fence to the airport. And then when I touch down, I want to touch down at about 85 miles an hour. And oh. with, with my engines almost back at idle, just enough to kind of keep the nose up. Oh, yeah, so, you power off over the fence. Basically, all you're doing with the altitude or with your throttle is you're controlling your altitude. And then at the last minute, you slow down by raising your nose as you yep. start running out of flying speed. That's something that a lot of people don't understand about airplanes. And that's one of the reasons that we don't dip our nose. All we do is cut back on the power a little bit and we basically fly around the curve. It's not a big deal. Well, I don't know about you, but I found that to be an interesting conversation and hopefully you picked up a few things from it. We're going to continue in this tone with Wolfie 6020 next week. So I hope you'll hit that little bell icon and the like and subscribe down there so that you don't miss any of our future releases. Now, I want to thank everybody for your support of this channel. We have memberships and a Patreon now, and every little bit helps. With the memberships, you get a lot more insight into the behind-the-scenes production of Bob the Science Guy, and do some live chats with me, so I hope you'll take the opportunity to do that. In the meantime, this is Bob the Science Guy signing out from Northern Michigan. Thank you very much for stopping by, and I hope to see you soon. Take care.